So I was just uh, going to talk about money. And so I better hurry up because uh, time's wasted. <laughs> Anyway, I had did have a whole bunch of logos here of different groups that uh, uh, we've been associated with. So I don't even know if I got the right thing here or not, but we're going to give it a try. Uh, money is an ancient innovation. Um, I really like that Michael Hudson said, you know, the origin of money was debt, but uh, that, you know, he didn't go back far enough, in my view, because Native uh peoples all around the world um, considered themselves in debt to the mother, to the earth mother. And so they devised a payment system to pay the earth mother for what they would take for sustenance. And they did this all around the world. Um, I can give you dozens, many examples. And it was just a, uh, an honoring, a gratitude. It was a sacred ritual. And that was money. Uh, I think the origin of money, and uh, and then of course we had the Greek temples, and which is like the icon of the bank, and uh, and then we have the rod of Asclepius, like up here that little uh, monetary or the little uh, dollar sign, that's like the rod of Asclepius, which is uh, the medical symbol which the you know people brought their wealth to the temple to uh, um, uh, exchange for whatever uh, favors they could get. And so anyway, gradually money evolved into a um, means of uh, trade and exchange. And so uh, it's a social tech embodied in law or custom. And uh, originally it was custom and then it became law. And uh, it was an unconditional payment system and it was an agreement <clears throat> to use a particular thing to represent value in the exchange of goods and services. And there's these three functions of uh, it's a means of exchange, a unit of account and a store of value. But I highlighted the store of value because that has created problems for us. And I'll explain that as I go through, uh, because it addresses uh, what it's referring to is if you've got a store of value, you can accumulate a massive amount of money. And that is what uh, Aristotle pointed out was made money an instrument of power. So the hidden hand that can control the market by an industry, by a government. <clears throat> One of my favorite quotes is Bernard Leterre. And of course, when I got into monetary reform, that's where I started. I was I started. Uh, well, <laughs> I was in a community and we were trying to figure out how to uh, and, and, you know, we didn't do any exchange uh, much to speak of. It was kind of a socialist kind of setup where uh, we um, collectively pooled our money and then bought the groceries <laughs> and then shared the groceries. Um, but uh, he points out that since the dawn of times, monetary systems have been shaping the flows of human activity in every realm of endeavor, food production, education, health, business, etc. By determining how we value, apply, and exchange our creativity and the fruits of our labor. It is for this reason, and this is the main point, it's the most influential of human-made systems. It is the most influential of all human-made systems. So warning, there's uh, physical and psychological consequences. <laughs> and, oh, I don't have the right one. But anyway, uh, this is kind of a U.S.-centric kind of a presentation in a way because we're uh, uh, Alliance for Just Money is a, for the American thing, uh, the U.S. And, uh, but the U.S. is the only developed nation in the world where people can go bankrupt due to medical bills. Uh, yeah. Yeah because there's not enough money, they say. And of course, we've got housing prices going up. We've got rent prices going up. And we've got income not going quite so up, but up. And we've got 600,000 people living in the street and 16 million empty homes. But there's plenty of money because we got trillions, as we all know. You just look at the Fred uh, graphs and you can see we have trillions of money. So where is it? Oh, there it is. It's in the speculative economy in 
the uh, stock market instead of in the productive economy where we all live and work. And uh, so that's the assets that Michael was talking about that we need to just disappear. <laughs> it can go away, fine. And we don't need that. And so because we got more debt than money. And as the Bible said, the rich rule the poor. The borrower is the slave of the lender. So we've got these slaves, this big stack of slaves over here. What are they being doing? Well, they're destroying the planet because they're digging for the oil and digging all the rare metals and they're digging up all and making all this stuff and they're wasting stuff and they're making a big mess. And uh, that's a problem. We have an exponential financial system, but a linear is material economy. So the green is the material economy down here, right? It's flat. It's just straight. It's finite. But the financial system is exponential. And so trying to uh, drive that thing is we're just reaching our limits and we're blowing past the limits. And because it's all about a profit motivation only, you know, well, it's actually, there's an ideology behind it, but, uh, you know, more profit, more power, and more, more, more. And so we're pushing past the limits. Well, <clears throat> Kate Raworth come up with the donut economics utilizing that and saying, yeah, right, we've got blowing past the limits on the outside. And then we got people falling down the middle on the inside without, you know, decent housing, health care, et cetera. And so everybody needs to be up here in the green donut, you know, not overshooting, not shortfalling. <clears throat> Good idea, great model for fiscal spending, it seems to me. <clears throat> so the problem, and a lot of people say this, is capitalism. But capitalism um, has different... Uh, I, I've heard different definitions for capitalism, and usually they sound like free enterprise to me. They don't sound like capitalism because capitalism, when I look at capitalism, I say capitalism money ism is the system. It's the money system, and it's a specific kind of money system. It's a kind that issues money for debt, which is usury. So the central feature and source of capitalism's awesome power is the money system. That's how they buy stuff. That's how they own the means of production, right? Privately owned banks create and allocate all the money. So they decide where it goes, who it goes to, if it's profitable or not. And that's all they care about is the profit. So it's just the profit motivation that's just really driving this uh, destruction uh, along with their money system, which really facilitates it because it issues all money as interest-bearing debt for profit. And it's a system of debt is a parasite on the back of free enterprise. You see that, that free enterprise is in debt to the bankers because the bankers got all the money. And so free enterprise is uh, being parasitized by the money system. And wealth is being extracted out of them via interest and compounding interest. Uh, out of the production of what people are making. And everyone's made dependent on the banking system. And money is the mechanism of corruption. It's what controls public policy. Massive, you know, 5.8, well, we'll talk about those numbers later, but there, there's a massive amount of money goes into Congress. Congress says, okay, yeah. And, oh, you did you write a law? Thank you. We'll stamp it. And there it goes. Uh, corporate lawyers write our laws. And money is the governing factor. So if a government's not controlling the money, they're not governing. And so, oh yeah, well, I like these quotes. This is one of the slides I just threw away just because I didn't want to spend time on quotes, but they're, they're great quotes. Josiah Stamp uh, talking about how, you know, if you want to be rain, remain a slave, let the bankers keep creating deposits. <laughs> That's pretty simple. And, you know, the Pujo committee proved that uh, the banks controlled every industry. By 1912, they controlled every industry in this country. And there was cartoons. Here's a cartoon down here. You see J.P. Morgan 
and Uncle Sam, little old poor little Uncle Sam, J.P. Morgan's a monster. He's still a monster, but he's owned by Black Rod, an even bigger monster, <laughs> right? So there you go. It's a big system, and uh, it's and so it'll take a big movement to change it, I think, you know, uh, an aware movement. Uh, you know, this is theater. This is your government, right? We have this this display of power and decision making and everything but money's back here to making all the decisions and and uh, if they don't want you to fund something you don't fund it so what are the consequences of wealth power and concentration uh, you know justice louis brandis has a famous quote he said we have democracy in this country or we can have great wealth and concentrated in the hands of a few but we can't have both because that concentrated wealth destroys democracy. It raises prices 50%, like almost 50% of the uh, consumer uh, products that people buy is interest, okay? So it raises the prices. It lowers the wages because that's maximizing profit. Inhibits good job creation. Again, they want to pump all the, uh, the gas out of everything before they move on to the next technology. Uh, restricts worker power. Um, undermines small businesses and community well-being. Depresses business dynamism. Undermines innovation. Reinforces racial inequity and injustice. Jeopardizes Americans' health and safety and threatens the supply of critical goods. We've all seen that happen in our lives and, and uh, especially lately. <laughs> and here's the Princeton study where it was talking about how, you know, they spent $5.8 billion in uh, influencing the government and got back $4.4 .4 trillion in five years. That's a 758% return on investment. That is massive. And of course, banks have known for a long time that governments were their best investment, right? That's what they were doing in Europe early on. Uh, they were getting control of monetary systems of countries because they were in debt to them, more debt for the Crusades and all that stuff, you know, and put an end to the wonderful systems that they had in the high Middle Ages that were human uh brilliance flourished for 250 years before they slammed the door shut um, with debt, with usury. And, um, and so that's what we've been contending with ever since. And that's what revolutions are fought about. That's what the American Revolution was fought about, et cetera, right? So uh, it centralizes systems, it, it, you know, it centralizes our food production, which, you know, using toxic methods and industrial methods, which uh, means poor food, using more water and destroying the soil. And it centralizes populations, driving them off of the sustenance farms and into the big city centers and stuff. So we have these massive slums around these cities. Um, not so much in the U.S. yet, but I have a feeling they got plans for that. So there's these kinds of money. Now, I was supposed to talk about some of the fundamentals of money or somehow it works. I don't know. Anyway, we, don't, <clears throat> we probably all know this stuff, right? That we have coins and bills. That's the cash currency. But the money's created by the banks who created electronically. And the currency is used for their customers cash needs so if you have your in your account money you have some account money and you want to get it out in cash to go because you want to go do some stuff then you can just take some of your account money out as cash and uh and go on and the government supplies this sells it to the uh banks or to the fed which then sells it to the banks and uh for a bit of a I think they get the seniorage on it and the government gets the seniorage on the coins. We get about 300 million on coins every year just on the seniorage. So imagine what the seniorage would be for all the paper bills, which we sell at cost. Anyway, it's a lot. Um, so, oh yeah, and I, this is the one that has all these things in it that I took out. Um, I always like this slide because I always show the gray lines because those are the recessions and depressions that have happened. And this is the, you know, 
the money <laughs> the money system crashes every few years. <laughs> every 10 years is now it's running on about an average. It used to crash a lot more, as you can see, before uh 1930. And did a lot. And the, every time it crashes, what happens? People default on their loans and the bankers get the collateral. <laughs> So they, they make money on the interest going out, right? And the collateral coming back. All right. So what a deal. And uh, great history of money, of course. Our mentor, Stephen Zarlinga. Um, I, I miss his phone calls. I miss um, um, him being uh, hosting a live show in Chicago. <laughs> and uh, But this book is as michael hudson has said too is is like kind of critical to understanding the monetary system in this world and uh then i was going to talk about solutions a little bit just the uh uh you know how Howard, we have 10 minutes would you want to take i want to go on i want to skip all this stuff so we already talked about greenbacks and you know we've had the chicago plan and we've done all this stuff we got the need act now and oh yeah public banking never mind this is what i wanted to talk about with sylvia gassell and local currencies sylvia gassell a particular model of a, co of a local currency uh, that was uh, used in um, Wurgel, Austria. Now, it's a great story, and I don't have time to tell it in 10 minutes, so uh, I'll just say that it was also used in ancient Egypt, uh, a demurrage kind of money system where the money uh, goes down in value at a regular rate. And what that does is cause uh, the money to circulate fast. And in Wurgle, it, it circulated so fast they were able to accomplish $2.5 million worth of public works for $6,000 of uh, currency issued. And that was because it, its velocity was so high and people would pay their taxes. And when they saw that in paying their taxes that their public benefit was coming back to them, Directly. I mean, that's the way our taxes are supposed to be, right? We're supposed to pay taxes and see it coming back to us as health care and education and roads and all that stuff. Well, that's what was happening. And it was happening so fast that people started paying their taxes in advance saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it was an amazing thing. And the high Middle Ages was had a similar kind of system for that 250 years that I mentioned, where um money had a, a demurrage on it so that it kind of slowly reduced in value and this and and the beauty of it what and what's important about this and let me get to the oh shucks i don't i guess oh yeah here what set the world apart was that it was publicly issued first of all government issues it right the government issues it because that makes it official and everybody accepts it because you can pay your taxes with it. And it was used exclusively for the general welfare. That made it pretty special. And it had a parking fee on it, which created the high velocity of circulation, able to uh, do, like I said, uh, $2.5 uh, $2 million worth of public works in 15 months for with $6,000 in currency in circulation. Now, there was also another effect, which I think is so important because of the climate issue. And that is that the dynamics of net present value in a demurrage system, um, money's worth more in the future. And it causes people to start thinking long-term. And so um, not to waste too much time on this, but it is important that in Wurgle and in Egypt and in the high middle ages, People started thinking long term because their currency had a negative uh, rate on it instead of a positive interest rate on it that you had to pay, you know, and instead the, there was just this parking fee on it so that people couldn't hoard it. <laughs> and and so this. They're not doing that equation in their head, of course. Right. Nobody's doing that equation. That's just a subconscious impact of the monetary system. The debt monetary system, which is usury, also has a negative impact on people's thinking. 
Um, so we can turn it around. We can have positive impact. This is an example of that, that long-term thinking that we're going to need. The, the Native Americans, you know, they had seven generations of thinking going ahead. And that helped them care for this planet so well. And so I don't have my last slide exactly in here as before, but I'm, I think we can create the culture of care by creating an economy of care. And we do that by issuing money publicly for public purpose. And just simply doing that creates a care-based economy instead of a profit-based economy when the first use of money is going to public care. Anyway, the legislation's already written. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> I don't know if there's any time. There is there is a little time. And um, if, if you can stop sharing, we'll go for questions then where we can see each other. <laughs> Boy, sorry, I didn't find the right um, slideshow. It was shorter. <laughs> it was wonderful. And it was good, too. Thank you, Howard. Um, anybody uh, have a question for... Howard. Yeah. Um, Howard, could you explain to murage and first use? I don't understand those terms. Demurrage was a uh, a fee that um uh, had to be paid to um well Silvio Gasell worked in Argentina and he was watching the ships coming in and when they couldn't get into where they needed to to unload they had to do it in a waiting place and so there was a demurrage fee on that um, you know to compensate them for having to wait and he thought hmm how could that apply to money and so uh, he uh, realized that Money should degrade. It basically, you know, Frederick Soddy's hook. Uh, people talk about he's he hooked up money to the uh, second law of thermodynamics. Well, that's what Silvio Gassell did, <laughs> but he was a merchant, not an academic. But he he had hooked it up to the second law of thermodynamics, saying that money needed to grade the same way the materials that we buy with it degrades. Everything degrades. And so the money should too. The money should not be different from all the materials we buy with it because uh, instead of it allowing to be exponentially increased as it has in this world and see what the mess it's caused. Thank you, Howard. Any any other, another question? Demur, okay, uh, Sue Peters. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, so go ahead. Okay. Um, Howard, that was wonderful. I, I, I hope that you'll share those slides because there's they're so valuable. Yes. Um, yes. I want to ask you this question about the uh Sylvia Gassell experiment. And um it seems to me that uh the the focus that you just said about the money should be like the products that we all need to live on, that that's very similar to the history um, in the 20th century of the parity economy, where the focus is on not the money, but on the, the, the goods that we all need. On the wealth. Not the yes. Money. Money's just an exchange medium, please. <laughs> and that's what the demurrage thing was about, was to make it so that it was no longer a store of value, so that it was purely an exchange medium. Let's go on to Matthew. We got time for one more question. You're Matthew, muted. Matthew, you're muted. Matthew, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd love to comment more about what that value actually is historically, because money predates trade and it predates exchange. Um, but anyways, uh, you had this fantastic graph here that shows the number of uh, like crises in the U.S. and how it it uh, gets more stable over time, it seems. 
Uh, that's a fantastic graph. What I would like to sort of maybe comment on is the international picture. And what I find fascinating about it is, um, I, I think I need to look at that graph more. Maybe you can comment. Um, the number of crises in the U.S. seems to drastically de decrease in frequency when the when the central bank gets in. Is that is that right? No, <laughs> it's nope. after the central bank screwed America so bad in nineteen in the thirties. <laughs> they yeah, uh, that was. I mean, they saw how the bankers screwed us. I mean, the Pecora Commission laid it out. You know that. The bankers had ripped off the nation. Yeah. So, so why, why, in your opinion, does does uh, do the crises get less frequent within the U.S.? And the the sort of international comment that I would like to mention is, it, it's interesting that these gray periods become less frequent over time because internationally, after Bretton Woods, they become very frequent with floating exchange rates. The number of currency crises across the world. Uh, have exploded. Banking failures across the world have exploded since the failure, since we've gotten into this floating exchange rate thing. So I think it's interesting that as America becomes more stable with this post Bretton Woods thing, right. um, so the rest of the world ha ends up taking this volatility right. from the US. But anyways, why do you think it becomes less volatile within within the US like because I think it's just like what you're yeah. saying it's happening everywhere else and and of course yeah. we are everywhere else we've got 800 military bases all around the world we're the only nation in the world that has military bases like that i mean the second i mean russia has a couple right you know or china has a couple you know we we've got 800 <laughs> so we are uh surrounding the world and our money surrounds the world and uh, and of course, being the uh, exchange currency, it's, we're in a very powerful position. And of course, it's being challenged today. And that's that's uh, yeah. And I think we can challenge it from the bottom too with local currencies. And you know, they they want to shut it down. They're going to want to shut it down. Anything successful, but we've got to challenge them. I think anyway. Sorry. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Howard.